project, but you know, sometimes when you're going a little too fast, you know, you kind of, well, oh, we're going to build this video studio there, and then we're going to be with them, and, and, and I realized I'm babbling, you know, and the person on the other end of the line should have really said, well, thank you so much for your very interesting idea, click, you know, but instead, she said, um, tell me more. And this was the lead lawyer at Reprieve. And she said, I think I have somebody who might be interested in it's the youngest uh, detainee from Guantanamo. And he was, uh, he lives in West Africa now, but he spent seven years in Guantanamo. And so I learned about his history. I was like, I thought, oh, whoa, because um, uh, we're, we're, there's a kind of blackout on information about Guantanamo in this country, frankly, and uh, a lot of, um, misinformation. So uh, anyway, I eventually got a phone call with, with him. He lives in West Africa now. And he was very interested in doing it, very open. This is a, kid, a guy who is now 26. But he was captured when he was 14. He was, had the bad luck of, you know, wanting to study computers in Pakistan in his uncle's computer um, school. And he went there and he was swept in with a group of people because we need basically, we need Saudis. Uh, so he was accused of being a, 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 a terrorist um, and a, a Taliban guy, and they said, well, he was a London operative. And the trouble was at that time he was 11 years old. You know how 11-year-olds can be those sneaky operatives getting all that from. Um, anyway, to, to, as I got deeper into learning about Guantanamo, I can tell you, uh, you all know more about the Taliban than any of the guys there, except for maybe like 2%. They're, it's cab drivers and it was students and unlucky people who just got dragged in because they profiled correctly. Um, so anyway, I'm talking to, I finally went to West Africa to meet Mohammed El Gharani, and I was the first American that he met who wasn't his torturer or his interrogator. So it was very, very intense series of meetings and about, and I said, you know, why would you want to do this moment? And, you know, I'm, I'm setting up little models of how it would work and how it would work in the armory. And he was like, see, I, I'm doing this to help my brothers in Guantanamo. And I said, Mohammed, oh, it's an art project. I don't know that this is going to help your brothers in Guantanamo. I can tell you that if you tell your story um, the way you, you've told me, that you'll find a lot of American brothers and American sisters who will understand what you're saying. Because his story, of course, was the opposite of the U.S. government story. And he was um, uh, accused of many, many things who were just totally absurd and he was never charged. Because it all works with language, you know, when all of these people who were dragged in were immediately declared non-persons. And when you're a non-person, you, you're not, the Geneva, Geneva Convention it doesn't apply to you because you're not a person. Uh, another thing they did was, they, they said, uh, uh, American doctors and American psychologists were at all the torture sessions. Mohammed had been, um, basically, uh, his head had been broken, he was, had been cut everywhere, and many, many, it, it, it was sickening to hear what we did to this person. And, but we were not allowed to say, you know, American doctors and psychologists were present at all the torture sessions. We could say, um, what is allowed to say, uh, is the American Behavioral Science Consultancy team was at present at all the torture sessions. That was okay to say. Another thing that happened was there were many, many, many suicides in Guantanamo. Many. It's a desperate place. Many of them. But suddenly, boom, they're none. Why? Well, there was a big uptick in uh, self-manipulative behavior resulting in death, but no suicides. So, wow. you know, just the, the, the language thing, and you know this from the elections too, you know, how it gets bent and, you know, into like unrecognizable patterns. So anyway, um, we made a, a film of, of Mohammed's uh, story as well because he said, how did he manage? He's funny and he's open and he's, uh, he's trying to get a citizen to be probably won't be able to because we make it very, very hard. It's interesting. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that might be, get off 
stage. Okay, so I'm going to show you some pictures, and then and then Jan is going to join me. Here we are. We built in the Park Avenue Armory. We built a, a statue the size of the Lincoln Memorial, and we built a studio in West Africa and beamed Mohammed in to uh, the stu to Armory. We played um, some very 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 loud drone music, which are Lou Reed's guitars, leaned against his amps with open tunings that made these incredible um, uh, uh, overtones and harmonics. Um, here's, he was part of a, a performance as well. He spoke as well in, in, and uh, told some of the things that happened to him and, and what he was thinking about. And what was amazing about this thing was that uh, I learned Never ever underestimate the audience because people here came and they, they brought instruments, and, uh, horns and Iranian bagpipes and people did Tai Chi and ballet and it became a whole new, like really strange art form. We had a camera in the ceiling way, way up. The Park Avenue Army is huge. And in front, here's the statue and here's the camera. So people, he could see the people who came to him. We, had not, we didn't have an audio feed because they didn't want someone coming in and going, you terrorist, you know, he'd had like 15 years of, of that, and, and so, um, but there were all of these people who got into the sight line so that he could see them in Africa, and they're gesturing to him, and they're like, trying to like, talk to him, they're going, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. It was, it was just heart stopping people who had, we also had a very, very thick legal brief. Those of, those people who wanted to drill down into the case and really find out what what it is to charge someone based on nothing. And it, it was called habeas corpus because of course this is the law that means the king can't keep you in the dungeon without without your ability to go to court. You get, you get your day in court. Of course, none of these people did because they were not people, they were not persons declared non-persons. So anyway, um, I, I, uh, I felt very privileged to work with this, with this person, with uh, Mohammed al Gharani, and um, I'm going to invite Jenna up uh, now to, to join me, and while she comes, I want to say...